this morning, hallelujah, as we welcome our pastor to, hallelujah, pastor, you're welcome. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. This morning we are moving forward in our time of um, the word. Amen. But I don't know about you. I've been blessed already today. It's been a wonderful time. Just a wonderful service. We praise God um, for all he's doing. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. 2 Kings chapter 2, as we read together from verse 1 to 15. I'll pause for 30 seconds so that we can all get there. 2 Kings chapter 2, as we study God's word together this morning. Praise the Lord. If you're there, say amen. If you're not there, say wait for me. All right, we're all there. Let's read. 2 Kings 2, verse 1 to 15. Please follow along in your Bibles. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha Verse 2 said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Notice the exclamation point. I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please. Notice he's polite. Stay here, please. For the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets. It's third time we're seeing sons of the prophets. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taking away from you. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then, from, then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elijah crossed over now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to him and he bowed to the ground before him. May the Lord bless us with understanding hearts of his word in Jesus' name. This morning for the next several minutes, we are going to be speaking from the message titled, Going the extra mile. Going the extra 
mile. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We're so grateful, Lord. Our hearts are filled with thanksgiving, even as we've been praying today, thanking you, Lord, because you are good, because your mercy endures forever. And this morning, as we come to your word, we are grateful for your word. And we're grateful for Jesus. And we're grateful for the name of Jesus. And as we have sung today, we thank you, Lord, that every other name fades. Every other name fades away till only your name remains. That's our prayer. That's our longing. We thank you, Lord, that one of your names we've been studying is Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh, the I am that I am. The I am that I am. The self-sufficient and self-existing one. The revealer of secrets. The author of salvation. Yahweh, we look to you this morning that as we study your word, that you would give us understanding hearts. We pray that your word will strike the target of our hearts. We pray that your word will do everything you have sent it to do. We pray, O oh God, that you will give us receptive hearts. May our hearts be soil, good soil, so that your word will bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. And Lord, let your name and your name alone be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. This morning we are continuing in our series, Double Portion double portion we began the series two weeks ago with a message on the god of the double portion as we reflected on the spiritual truth that the principal actor in our text the text for our series the text we've read today the principal actor in our text was not elisha it definitely wasn't the sons of the prophets. It wasn't even Elijah. The principal actor in our text was God. The God of the double portion. The God who called Elijah, who called Elisha. The God of the anointing. Last week we discussed the power of the uncommon mentor. Protege and anointing. As we looked at lessons on mentorship from the life of Elisha and Elijah, Elijah being the uncommon mentor, Elisha the uncommon protege, and we looked at different measures of the anointing. We have seen in the series that Elisha's request for a double portion was to be doubly blessed, similar to how the firstborn son would inherit a double portion of the father's possessions in the law of Moses. We talked about this, right? If a man had, let's say, three sons, for instance, and it came time to divide his inheritance, he would divide his inheritance into how many parts? Four. Each son would get, each other son would get one portion of the inheritance, but the firstborn would get what? Two. He would get the double portion of the father's inheritance. And so in essence, when Elisha asks Elijah for a double portion, he is asking that he would receive a double inheritance of the spirit of God that was in Elijah, the Holy Spirit. He was asking for a double portion of the Holy Spirit. He was asking for a greater measure of the anointing. A double portion of the inheritance. And similarly, we as believers today, every believer today needs a greater measure of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need a greater measure of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we define the anointing of the Holy Spirit as the power, the presence, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need a greater measure of the Holy Spirit so that we can fulfill God's call upon our lives. Just like Elisha asked for a double portion so that he could fulfill the responsibilities of the prophetic office to which God had already called him. God had previously called him. He asked for a double portion. And so in our message today, for our message today, we will look at Elisha's determination to follow Elijah to the very end. And in that message or in that story, as we look at, focus on that aspect of our text, his determination to follow Elijah to the very end, we will discuss three lessons 
that we see from Elisha's example. So let's jump right into it. Our first lesson that we see from Elisha's example, his determination to follow Elisha to the very end. We see three lessons about going the extra mile. The first lesson that we see is that Elisha was tested. Elisha was tested. And if we too will receive a greater measure of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we will be tested. We will be tested. Let's start from verse 1 of our text. In verse 1, we encounter Elijah and Elisha. They're in a city where? Gilgal. In the city of Gilgal, Elijah is about to go on a trip from Gilgal to Bethel because God had sent him on a mission to Bethel. We don't know what God sent him to do, but we know God sent him. And he said to Elisha, he said, stay here, please. In verse 2, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. Of course, we've read the story, so we know that this is the first of three tests that Elisha would face in our text. Three tests that he would face. I say tests because it appears that this is not a command that Elijah gives Elisha. He says, stay here, please. He's polite. He, 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 it appears as we look at it, he's, he's, he's trying to test him. He's trying to, to see if he will oblige if he will remain if he will take the easy route the first of three tests that Elisha would face in our text before he would even get an opportunity to make a request it's tested three times to get the right to even make a request before Elijah was taken Elisha was literally willing to go the extra mile he was literally willing to go the extra mile. Bible scholars tell us that the distance from Gilgal to Bethel was about seven miles. This Gilgal was the Gilgal that was in the mountains of Ephraim. Some Bible scholars tell us that it was, if we are to believe that it is the Gilgal in the mountains of Ephraim and not the Gilgal that was by the Jordan, right? Then it was seven miles. And there's reasons why many Bible scholars believe it, it was that Gilgal in the hills of Ephraim. It was seven miles north of Bethel. Elisha was literally willing to go not just one extra mile. He was willing to go seven extra miles to get the anointing. He was willing to go the extra mile. Not once. Not twice, but three times. In verse 4 and 6 of our text, we read of the second and third test. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here. Please, for the Lord has sent me unto Jericho. Verse 6, we read the third test. Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. Each time Elisha's response, his recurring theme was what? I will not leave you. Exclamation point. I will not leave you. I will not leave you. Elisha adamantly refused each time. In his response, we see the extent of his devotion and his commitment to remain with his master to the end. Let's go back to verse 2. Elijah got done in Bethel. He told Elisha to wait in Bethel because same thing. God has sent me on a mission to Jericho. Bible scholars tell us that Jericho was about 14 miles from Bethel. This was a longer and rougher journey than the one from Bethel. It was a longer and rougher journey. Elisha could have thought to himself, let me spare myself. This long and rugged journey from Bethel to Jericho. But again, we see that he remained steadfast in his resolution to remain with Elijah to the end. As best as we can tell, the other sons, the sons of the prophets in Bethel were content to remain in Bethel. But Elijah was not, Elisha, excuse me, was not content to remain in Bethel. He followed Elijah unto Jericho. He was willing to go the extra mile, seven extra miles from Bethel, from Gilgal to Bethel. Now 14 miles, extra miles from Bethel to Jericho. He was willing to go the extra mile. He didn't mind the inconvenience or the difficulty. He was willing to pay the price for what he wanted. In verse 6, when Elijah was done in Jericho, he asked Elisha to wait there because God had sent him to the Jordan. Jordan, Jericho, Bible students know, right? The distance from Jordan to Jericho was just only a few miles. The, the Israelites crossed the Jordan, right? They went to Jericho, first city they defeated. It was just a couple of miles up from Jericho, east of Jericho, we're told by Bible scholars, but still Elisha didn't budge. Elisha's tenacity reminds us 
of the story of a woman in the Bible. Ruth, right? Ruth. She stayed committed to Naomi. Listen to Ruth 1, 15. And she said, for Naomi, to Ruth, Luke, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. Return back from falling after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will, will I be buried. The Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts me, you and me. And she saw that she was determined to go with her. She stopped speaking to her. We're talking about passing a test. Ruth probably didn't think or realize that she was being tested. But in hindsight, I believe it was a test. And of course, we know that she would go on to occupy a prominent role in the, in the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. She didn't realize that she was being tested. Elisha too probably didn't realize that he was being tested, but he remained faithful to his calling as a servant of Elijah. And a lesson from us, for us from this is that it may not always to be obvious to us that we are being tested. It may not always be obvious. But if we remain faithful to our calling, God had called Elisha to be a servant to Elijah. And as long as he remained faithful to his calling, amen, he passed the test. He passed the test. God has entrusted things to us. And if we remain faithful in those things, in all things, we can pass our tests. Elisha was tested. We already said this. Being, if we want a greater measure of the anointing, being tested is par for the course. Being tested is what? Par from the course, for the course. Elisha was tested and we will be tested. In our Christian work, walk, excuse me, we will be tested. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm being honest, the truth, most people, if I'm being honest, the truth is that if I was given the choice, I would not want to go through a test. I mean, I would want to get the grade. I'd want to get the A without sitting for the exam. Anybody, anybody, I mean, like, let, let's just be real. I, I would just want to say, give me the A, give me five, give me A plus, give me stellar, give me like the best result, but keep the test. But keep the test. We'd rather avoid the test altogether. We're so disinclined to taking tests that when we go through tests, our first instinct sometimes is we're shocked. Why am I going through this? Why me? I'm a Christian. Why is this happening to me? As if being tested is something that is a punishment or something that we shouldn't receive as Christians. Or maybe we, 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 we've kind of understood that, yes, I, I can be tested, but then we may think God has forsaken us. I mean, this test has been going on for so long. He's forsaken me. We even feel like giving up on God because of the difficulties. But that's the wrong mindset to have. Elisha was tested. We will be tested. And if we have the right, rights, if we have the right mindset, then it will help us. Now, to be sure, we're not minimizing challenges. We're not minimizing difficulties. Tests are hard. Tests can be hard. I've been in hard places. I've been in hard places where it's hard to see God, where it's hard to look at Him. But if we have the mindset, if we have that mindset, we often miss, we miss when we're in the midst of our tests, that the greater the tests we face, the greater attainment we will obtain. The greater the test we face, the greater the joy and the reward that is waiting for us on the other side of the test. The greater the test, the greater the testimony. When we view tests in this mindset, then we can be encouraged to endure as we keep our eyes on what God is doing, on what, what he is working in us, and on what he is working through us for his glory. 
and we trust him to see us through the test. Listen to James 1, verse 2 to 4 and verse 12. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Blessed is the man, verse 12, who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has prom promised to those who love him. Amen. 1 Peter 4, verse 12 to 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings for that you may also be, excuse me, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted by the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If we want a greater measure of God's anointing, we can be sure that we will go through tests because through them, through tests, we are built up. Through them, we are strengthened in our faith. And through these tests, we can become more spiritually mature. But the question for us today is, am I willing to be tested? Am I willing to be tested? Am I willing to be tested? Because the truth is not everyone, we already saw it, not, not, every, not everyone is willing to be tested. Not everyone's willing to pay the price to follow Jesus. And similarly, not everyone is willing to pay the price for God's anointing. May we be just as determined as Elisha to face the tests that come our way so that we can receive a greater measure of God's anointing. Elisha was tested. That's our first point, our first lesson today. Our second lesson today, Elisha was tested focused. Elisha was tested. Elisha was focused. We see this vividly in his interactions with the sons of the prophets. In two of the cities where he and Elijah went, the sons of the prophets in Bethel asked, and the sons of the prophets in Jericho asked, and then the sons of the prophets followed them to the Jordan and watched from a distance, right? That's what we read. Now, these sons of the prophets were spiritual men who were devoted to God, right? I mean, they were sons of the prophets. These were not just outsiders, commoners. These were sons of the prophets. These are people who, if we understand the phrasing correctly and what it means, these were people who were in training to become prophets. They were spiritual men devoted to God. They were listening for God's voice. They received prophecy from God. But Elisha went the extra mile. He went the extra mile. In Bethel, if we understand the story correctly, the sons of the prophets were content to wait in Bethel. Elisha went to Jericho. In Jericho, the sons of the prophets did better than in Jericho than those in Bethel. They at least went to the Jordan, but they watched from a distance. They weren't willing to cross. They watched from a distance. Both Elisha and the sons of the prophets knew that Elijah was about to be taken, but only Elisha was focused on the anointing. Elisha could have asked for anything, wealth, position, fame. Instead, he wanted what? The anointing. He wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. You see, some people, it's possible to say Elisha was greedy. I mean, he didn't just ask for a, a one, he said a double portion. But as long as our motives are pure, we cannot be too greedy when it comes to wanting more of God's anointing. Amen. We cannot be too greedy when it comes to wanting more of God's anointing. He says, give me a double portion. He wanted a double portion. He wanted to go. He was focused on it. He wanted it so he could fulfill the office to which God had called him. The sons of the prophets were focused on what was about to happen. But Elisha was focused on what he wanted to receive from God. In Bethel, both in Bethel, excuse me, and Jericho, the sons of the prophets say, said, do you know? They, were, they, were, they, they knew what was about to happen. But each time Elisha's response was what? Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elisha was focused in his pursuit of the anointing. He refused to be distracted in his pursuit of the anointing. And this brings us to another important lesson. If we are serious about the anointing, if we are serious about receiving more of God's anointing, we too must avoid distractions. We must avoid distractions. We must be prepared to live lives of righteousness. We must run from sin. 
We must be unwilling to compromise with sin. We must not toy with sin because nothing destroys anointing like sin. Sin and anointing don't go together. They don't mix. Remember Saul, King Saul in the Bible, in the Old Testament, he compromised with sin till the Spirit of God departed from him. Remember Samson in the Bible, he toyed with sin and he not only lost the anointing, it destroyed him. It destroyed him. Somebody has said, sin will keep you longer than you want it to stay. It will take you farther than you planned to go. And it will cost you more than you were willing to pay. Don't toy with sin. Don't be distracted. If there are people, things, or places in your life that lead you to sin or that keep you from prayer or that keep you from studying God's word or from fellowship with other believers, get rid of them as a matter of urgency. Flee from sin. If you've fallen into sin, then we have an example like Samson who was, he repented. He repented and God heard his prayer. So if you've fallen into sin, don't feel hopeless. Amen. Turn away from it and turn back to God. And then determine, Lord, help me to be focused. Help me not to get distracted. Listen to 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 to 22. It says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Listen to verse 21. Flee also youthful lusts. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Listen to Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. First Peter 5 verse 8 to 9, it says, be, be sober, be vigilant. Do you see focus? Like be sober, keep your mind clear. Don't allow your mind to get distracted. Stay sober, don't get intoxicated, don't get distracted. Stay sober, stay vigilant, keep your eyes open because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Returning to our text, Elisha knew that God was about to take his master away. He acknowledged what the sons of the prophets said, but then he told them to keep silent told them to keep silent. We already talked about this next point. The sons of the prophets in, in, in Bethel didn't even go to Jericho. In Jericho, they stayed at a distance. But Elisha stayed close to Elijah. He wasn't content to watch things from a distance. He went the extra mile. He wanted to be right in the thick of the action. He wanted to be in the game rather than on the sidelines. I think if Elisha was alive today, I think he would be the kind of believer that never wanted to miss church. I think he would be the kind of believer that never wanted to miss a night of worship. I think he'd be the kind of believer that it would pain him if he had to miss a prayer meeting. I mean, he wanted to be in it. He wanted to be in the thick of action. He, I think he'd be the kind of believer that would be like evangelism. Oh, I must be there. If he, if he couldn't be there, it, it, it would be something significant, something important. He, it would pain him to miss evangelism. It would pain him to miss God's presence. It would pain him that he hasn't spent time with God. He went the extra mile, seven extra extra miles 14 extra miles on foot I believe right they didn't have cars or anything maybe at best on a donkey he was willing to pay the price he was focused he was focused he didn't allow himself to be distracted I think that's the kind of believer Elisha would be I think Elisha challenges us in our day and age to be those kind of believers who are willing to go the extra mile for the anointing may God help us May we be just as focused as Elisha was in his pursuit of a greater measure of God's anointing. Elisha was tested. Our first point, Elisha was focused. That's our second point. Our third and final point today, Elisha was prepared. Elisha was prepared. We've seen three times he was tested. His devotion was tested. All three times Elisha passed the test. 
It was only when Elisha had withstood the testing that Elisha, Elijah, I hope I've been keeping it straight. I feel like I may have missed it, messed up, but if I do, you know what I mean. It's, yeah, Elisha, Elijah, we actually saw the meanings of the names, but we're, we're running out of time a few weeks ago. They're, they're both names about Yahweh. Um, do research if you want to learn more. So similar names, so no, 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 no surprise that we're, we're uh, mixing them up. But Elisha, after he had withstood the test, then Elijah offered him a big invitation. In verse 9, it was big. Make no mistake. Ask. I'm about to be taken from you. Ask what you want before I'm taken. And from Elisha's response, we see that he was prepared. He was prepared. His response was specific. He knew what he wanted. He didn't ask for time to go think about it, what, about what I wanted. He didn't beat around the bush. He asked and he asked big. He was prepared. He knew what he wanted. He had gone through the test. He was focused on it. And when it came time to ask, he was prepared and he asked big. I mean, think about it. If he came to a moment like that and Elisha says, ask. Notice Elisha's ask. It was a big estimation. It was like there's an estimation by it. Imagine he comes to that moment. What we could summarize as the moment of destiny. Imagine Elisha comes to that moment and Elijah says, ask. And Elisha is like, um, um, um. I mean, he's passed the test. I mean, he's avoided the distraction. But then he comes to the moment and he's not prepared. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Elisha was prepared. Briefly, I want to answer the question, what are some ways that we can prepare for God's anointing? Because we want to make it practical. What are some ways we can prepare so that we too can be ready to receive God's anointing. And we'll answer this question by looking at the significance of the cities that Elijah and Elisha visited. Because in those cities, we see some characteristics of those cities. The first way that we can prepare for God's anointing, we see from Bethel. It is spending regular time with God and in prayer and spending regular time in God's presence. Why do we say that? Because Bethel means house of God. Bethel was where God spoke to Jacob when he had a vision of a ladder going up to heaven in Genesis chapter 28. It was where the children of Israel in the book of Judges chapter 20 verse 18, where when they were on their, on their way, um, when they were on their way to um, judge the wickedness of the sons of Ephraim, I believe it is, the tribe of Ephraim, were told they stopped in Bethel to inquire of the Lord. It was where Abraham, Bethel was where Abraham sacrificed and built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. We see that in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 13. Spending regular time with God means that we begin each day with him in the place of prayer and we have regular times that we set apart with him. It means that we make time for God personally and we make time to join others in prayer. It means that we read our Bibles daily. It means that as we read our Bibles, we take notes, we go deeper, we study what we have read, we consult other resources. You consult a study Bible. You consult resources that, that are out there online. Resources, it means investing in resources so that we can grow in our understanding and our knowledge of God's word. It means as we're studying, we're taking time to ask the Holy Spirit to stir things in our hearts as we read. You want to be ready for the anointing. You want to be prepared for the anointing. Make it a priority to spend time with God. Elisha must have spent time with God for him to be prepared. The second way that we can be prepared is we see in the city of Jericho, and it is walking in obedience to God's instructions. If I asked you, what is Jericho known for? First thing, Jericho. David, walls falling. Ding, 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 ding. That's correct. The walls fall, it's victory, right? The children of Israel cross walls. This morning I learned from my brothers. He was leading us in prayer that the walls of Jericho were so wide. They were big walls. They were so wide the chariots could run on them. This was a big victory. But what was the key to the victory? Obedience. Very specific instructions. In fact, we see if you're looking for a lesson in obedience, the story of Jericho is a prime one because there was a man who was disobedient. Anybody remember him? Anybody remember him? Achan. Disobedient. 
He took some of the things that were forbidden. And then the Israelites went, oh, I, small city, we can de defeat them. Don't send those, don't, don't trouble the whole camp. And they suffered an embarrassing and costly defeat. If you want to be prepared for the anointing, we must learn to walk to, in obedience to God's instructions. We see that from Jericho. As a result of Achan's disobedience, the Israelites will go on to lose their next battle in the city of Ai. If we truly desire more of God's spirit like Elisha did, we must walk in obedience to him. Amen. The final way we can prepare for God's anointing is by, and we see this from Jordan, is by consecrating ourselves to God in the place of service consecrating ourselves to God in the place of service. Of course, Jordan, most people remember Jordan as where the Israelites crossed over into the promised land, and that is correct. When they came on the banks of the Jordan, they crossed from the east to the west across the Jordan. Some of them stayed, two tribes and half a tribe stayed behind on the east side of the Jordan, but then the rest of them crossed over to the west side and into the promised land. Not so many people remember something else that was significant about Jordan. Jordan was where our Lord Jesus Christ was baptized. And where the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit came down on him. Jordan was a place of ministry, consecration in the ministry. Yes, it was a place where they crossed over. But it was a place where consecration happened. If we want to be entrusted with more by God, we must be faithful with what he has already given us. I'll say that again. If we want to be entrusted with more by God, we must be faithful with what he has already given us. The Jordan is a place of consecration in the place of service. It's a place of faithfulness with what we have already received. It's a place of stepping outside our comfort zones and making ourselves available to serve God. Listen to Jeremiah 29, verse 12 to 13. It says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Consecration. If you want to be prepared for the anointing, consecrate yourself to God in the place of service. James 1, verse 22 to 25. Sorry, that verse was actually for the first point. Spend time with God, regular time. Seek me with all your heart. Seek me, God says, with all your heart. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? All your heart. The second point on obedience, listen to James 1, verse 22 to 25. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and it's not a forgetful hero, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Let's learn to walk in obedience to God's instructions. And then Luke 16, verse 10 to 12, consecration in the place of service, being faithful with the little. Listen to Luke 16, says, verse 10 says, only, excuse me, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in what? Much. You say, oh, Lord, I want to be used by you to do great things. Lord, entrust great resources to me. God, entrust the gifts of the Spirit to me, and I will be faithful. God says, be faithful with the little I've given you. Be faithful with the things I've already given you. That's what he says to us. You want to be prepared. Be faithful with the little. Consecrate yourself to serve God faithfully with the little that he has given you. He who is faithful, who, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is f dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what, that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Consecration and faithfulness in the place of service. Elisha was prepared. And when I think of preparation, the story that comes to mind is that of the 
ten virgins, right? Five wise, five foolish virgins. We know the story, the parable Jesus told. The wise virgins, the wise virgins, excuse me, had a mission. They thought ahead about what they needed to fulfill their mission, and they took extra oil. They were prepared. In Elisha's case, his preparation meant that when his moment came and he received the opportunity to ask for something, he didn't ask amiss. He knew his calling. He knew what he wanted. And he asked for something big. He seized the moment. He asked for the right thing. Elisha was tested as our first lesson point. Amen. Elisha was focused. That's our second lesson point. Amen. And Elisha was prepared. That's our third and final lesson today. In closing today, the question we must each ask ourselves based on Elisha's example of going the extra mile that we've studied today is this. Am I willing to go the extra mile to obtain a greater measure of God's anointing? Am I willing? Because if you're not, God will leave you where you are. Somebody said to me a few weeks ago, very profound, he said, each of us can have as much of God as we want. I asked him the question, you know, in my journey and my growth, this year our theme is the double portion, and we're, we're studying the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so I asked him the question, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, seeking more. I said, are the gifts of the Holy Spirit for today? This is a pastor, somebody I greatly respect, Christian for many years, and so I was just trying to pick, you know, are the gifts of the Holy Spirit for today? You know, we, we, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, right? Uh, we went over them earlier in the series. I won't go over it, but you can look there. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophecy, gifts of healing, you know. Some of these gifts are, are profound. I mean, imagine being here today and, and God is telling you what's happening in, like, Portland, in somebody's room, I mean, they're in their room, shut, windows closed, shutters closed, blinds closed, doors locked. And they're doing something, and like, you're sitting here in Bellevue, and God reveals to you what they're doing. That happened to one of these men, I forget which of them, Elijah or Elisha. Right? This is like the king of Syria. He was making plans to attack. And Israel and Elisha would just, I don't know which one of them, but one of them would tell, would tell the king. And finally, the king said, there must be a spy. What's going on? And he was looking for the spy, and they said, no, 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 relax, relax, chill, chill, king. There's not a spy. It is, I forget again, Elijah or Elisha. Imagine that, Eli, Elisha, thank you, sir. It was Elisha. Imagine that. That's powerful. And so I was asking him, are the gifts of the Spirit, is the word of knowledge, that's the word of knowledge we just described, is the word of knowledge for today? And he gave me a long answer, but the one I want to pick out of it, and, and the short answer is yes. But what he said was, we, each of us, can have as much of God as we want. And so the question for you today, the question for me today, I'll repeat it, is am I willing to go the extra mile to obtain a greater measure of God's anointing? Am I willing to endure testing? Am I willing to stay focused and prepare myself so I can be used in a greater measure by the Holy Spirit? We must ask that and be honest with ourselves. And then if the answer is yes, and I pray the answer is yes, the answer for me is yes. I pray the answer for you is yes. But if the answer is yes, then we see like Elijah, we, we must be ready to endure testing. We must be faithful in following the Lord this year, passing any test he takes us through. When we do that, we're presenting ourselves to him as candidates for his anointing. Elisha wanted a difficult thing, a double portion of the spirit I was on Elijah, and he was willing to go the extra mile to obtain it. I pray that the answer to that question for you and me is yes. Yes, I want to pay the price. May God help us to remain steadfast in the midst of every test. May he help us to avoid distractions that could hinder us from a greater measure of the anointing. And may he help us to spend time in his presence walking in obedience to him and serving him faithfully even with the things that he has already blessed us with in jesus name amen amen would you rise to your feet this morning would you rise to your feet going the extra mile this year we're going to be talking about the double portion for the next several weeks but our theme for the year is the double portion can you just take the next few minutes and respond to god 
And our response is going to be two ways. If you're here today and you say, Jesus is not the Lord of my life. I'm not a Christian. Get right with God. Jesus has paid the price so that you can be right. I can be right with God. And so if that's you today, even as we close now, just begin to talk to God and say, Lord, I repent of my sins. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I believe Jesus is who he says he is, the son of God. I confess my sins to you and I accept his righteousness, his finished work. I make him my savior. Do that today. And the Bible says, if you do that, you are saved. You are saved. If you do it and you mean it, do it, you're saved. And we ask you today, if you don't mind, if you pray that prayer before you leave here, just find anybody and tell them, I gave my life to Christ. So if that's you, go ahead and respond. But the second response we're going to call for is a prayer that says, Father, please help me to go the extra mile so I can receive a greater measure of your spirit. Can we just make that our prayer today together, all of us? Lord, help us. Help us. Even as that song plays, I've decided to follow Jesus. We're out of time. As another story we're going to refer to, the rich young ruler. Jesus came to Jesus and Jesus said, go sell all you have. And the Bible says what? He departed. He was sad. Another story that we could have referenced today, the people who came to Jesus, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, follow me. And they started giving excuses. Let me go bury my dead. Let me go say bye to those at home. And Jesus said, no, no. Let the dead bury their dead. He who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not fit to follow. It's not fit for the kingdom of God. If we want a greater measure of his anointing, we must be ready to surrender all. We must be ready to follow. We must be ready to endure testing. We must be ready to stay focused. We must be ready to prepare. To prepare. So let's just sing that song very solemnly. Just once. I have decided dead to follow Jesus as we make that our prayer no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning Father, that's our prayer today. Help us to follow you. Help us like Elisha followed Elijah to the very end that we too will follow you all the way. Even as we trust you for a greater measure, a double portion of the anointing of the Holy Spirit this year. Help us, Lord, that we will not turn back because it's hard. We will not be distracted by sin. And Lord, we will not neglect making preparations so that we are ready whenever it is you are ready to move that's our prayer today and we ask lord that you will do it and help us oh god and we ask all these things in jesus mighty name amen let's share the grace together in fellowship may the grace of our lord jesus christ shall follow us all the days of our lives we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever in Jesus name amen God bless you church have a blessed week ahead in Jesus name